Get ready. Genesis Dutch. 16-bit arcade graphics. You can't go this on Nintendo. Genesis Dutch. 16-bit sports action. You can't go this on Nintendo. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Hello and welcome to episode 58 of the Sega Bit Slinging Report Show. It is Genesis Month and joining us as our very special returning guest... Mr. Darren Wall of the Kickstarter Sega Mega Drive Genesis Collected Works book. Hello, Darren. Hey, how you doing? Good. Welcome back. You're our first returning guest that I can remember. Hey, cool. Thanks for having me. It's been a little while. We've been busy. So we, had, we had a little trophy, but it's going to take about six to eight weeks to get to you in the mail. <laughs> um, I'll probably have to pay customs on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just write gift. Okay, yeah, printed paper. That's the gift, $5, because it actually costs $2 to make. But um, no, it is Genesis Month at Saga Bits, and it is also officially Streets of Rage Week, now uh, slash bare knuckle, which, at <laughs> least at the time of listening to this, we're recording a little earlier. But um, yeah, how, how have things been going with the project? I guess first off, we wanted to hear an update. It's been uh, since, I believe, November that we spoke. That's right, yeah, and it's um, it's been um, I think it's been a month since we've done a Kickstarter update as well, so there's quite a lot to talk about. Oh, awesome. um, so we're we're kind of in the the crunch of, of finishing things off. Really, everything's been finished in terms of the writing, which is uh, our writer Keith Stewart's essay, which at last check was eighteen thousand words. So we, we've had with all the extra money we made, we've had the the kind of luxury of being able to extend it as much as we liked, um, and that was the kind of comfortable length that ended up being. Uh, that's with Sega now. Uh, Sega of Japan, Sega of Europe, and Sega of America are all kind of checking their respective bits, um, and we're we're there with all the visual content. We've got a lot of kind of research done. Got a lot of images that we didn't have about a month ago um, from various people, kind of collectors, people who used to work for um, STI, Sega of America, and freelancers as well. Um, so yeah, all the content's ready, all being checked at the moment, and we're there with the the page design and everything. So we're just kind of waiting to get the big okay from Sega to to start putting everything together and, and start the repro process and send it off to print. So, yeah, it's 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 a really exciting moment. It's When I scroll up and down the InDesign document, it's like, this is, this is great. There's lots of stuff here. Very nice. So you, you really feel like you've covered just about everything that you can cover in the uh, in the history of the, the console? Yeah, yeah <laughs> we've done, done a good job. Um, yeah, I mean, we... When we, um, I think we mentioned this last time as well, when, when we put the Kickstarter up, we were approached by so many people who wanted to put us in contact with people we were previously unable to contact via Sega's old um, uh, channels. Um, so, and I don't think I mentioned this last time because I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was okay to do so, but one of the people who bought the book was David Rosen. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and um, he bought a special edition, and I remember sort of going to bed after a long a long day kind of looking after the Kickstarter and, and that popped up on my phone and I was like, is that, oh, oh my, that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, and he got in touch with us and, and offered to, to be a part of it. And, and, you know, he's kind of retired now, so we didn't really know how to contact him in the first place. So he's, uh, Keith interviewed him. Uh, we've spoken to Tom Kalinsky, uh, Shinobu Toyoda, um, and, and lots of other kind of big people we haven't spoken to before. And, and the essays have got a lot more, of the the people, the characters involved, the personality involved, actually telling the story in their own voice now, wow. um, which is great. And we've had lots of kind of revelations. You know, it's been so long, and um, I don't know if you know, there's a documentary coming out soon called uh, the sorry, there's a book coming out soon called Consult Wars. Yep. yep. I think they've been talking quite a lot, sort of, in, you know, to to people about this and realizing um, how much time's passed. And I think there's a lot more kind of comfort and, and openness for talking about what happened. Uh, and which is great for us, and it's, it seems like the perfect time to be speaking to them. So they were really, really friendly and really enthusiastic about it, and everyone just wanted it, everything to be told correctly, which is great from our point of view as well. Oh, that David Rosen, that's a that's a huge get. So you you did say he's contributing to the book in some. That's right. Yeah, he's in yeah. he's in our essay talking awesome. um, back and forth from from uh, Tom and uh, Hayao Nakayama as well about the kind of boardroom is it there's kind of lots of legendary boardroom stories about things like the the 149 dollar priced uh wow. genesis with sonic bundled in there's quite a lot of legends about that and everyone kind of sets the record straight um and yeah and then david rosen we, we probably you mentioned talking about this uh puts claim to the genesis title for the 
for the uh, consoles, for, of rena- renaming it the Genesis in the in the states. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the kind of legend put to bed, I guess. Wow. I mean, at eighty four years old, he's one of those people that you really you really need to get to him now than yeah. later because yeah. he's oh. got stories that you're never going to hear again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's too negative, Barry. You can't say stuff. No, like that. no, it's not. My, I mean, for example, I have. I mean, it's it's no way comparable. But I, I have some relatives who, when when I was a kid, my dad he would he would tell me he's like, look, you know, your great grandma, she's she's in her mid eighties. Let's go over there and just record her for a day, just telling stories. And so we would go and do that. And it's it's something I don't think people many people think about nowadays is that you know there are a lot of people with great stories from the past and. If you don't if you don't get to them now, you're going to be regretting it later on, and that's that's amazing. You got David Rosen. Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was it was pure, it com- completely due to the kind of crowdfunding, um, kind of the, the just the ridiculous amount of uh, of success we had with it. I think it within the industry and within kind of ex Sega circles, the amount of people that contacted us who used to work at STI, like just everyone contacted us and was really really helpful. Like su- such nice people sending us kind of, oh, I've got a scan of, like, this Comic Zone piece of art that wasn't finished, or someone sent us a scan of the uh, Comic Zone denim jacket, and just loads and loads of stuff that was coming to us. People were just really... What does the jacket it. look like? Like, what does it have on it? it it's uh, it's kind of like a, um, a Brian Adams-style stonewashed denim jacket. Are you uh, wearing it right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm really hot, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's very, 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 very tight. Uh, and it's got an embroidered um, ske- is it Sketch Turner, the character from Comic Zone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, bursting out of one of the pockets. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, on on the subject of David Rosen, I mean, you don't need to get too in depth, but how how is he doing? I think he's living in L.A. at the moment. Um, I'm not. Yeah, he told us. Yes, it was L.A. because he we had the time difference conversation. Oh, I dealt with his um, his PA, and I think Keith Keith Stewart, our writer, had a had a I think a, an hour telephone conversation with him about everything and. And talked about service games, and talked about you know the kind of the great moments with Genesis, and and he, he he sort of sent us some written notes as well. And what came across was how how proud he is of that time, and um, and about how how much trust I think he had in in the people that he worked with within Tom and uh, Nakayama, mm-hmm. and, and and the relationship that the three of them had. Um, and it, yeah, it just comes across that now is the time for reflection on this period and. And, and, and David Rosen certainly seems to be extremely proud of what Sega built them up themselves up to be at that time because you know it was just Sega were at the the height of their powers and you can understand he's really proud to have done it. What's his opinion on the company currently? Did he share that? Uh, we didn't talk about that, or at least I didn't because I didn't speak to him directly. I, mean, I mentioned Keith might have done. I'll ask him about that. Um, yeah, that would be interested to know. Is, is he directly involved in any way with, with Sega anymore? Um, he retired from the company as a chairman in 1996, according to the internet. <laughs> right, so. okay. Yeah, <laughs> the internet. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I, I wasn't privy to that, um, hmm. that conversation. But I think they did have a broader conversation about Sega and, and, and the Dreamcast and things like that. He wasn't just like, dude, they should make a Dreamcast too. Yeah, dude, Shenmue, right? <laughs> dude, come on, where's Shenmue three? Yeah, you know, but it's it's funny. I think of those those old timers, and I have to wonder if they even know that much of like the Dreamcast or Shenmue. I mean, I'm sure they know of it, but I gotta yeah. wonder how much he knows, or if he even has an opinion on on that stuff. Yeah, yeah, on uh, Shenmue and uh, Crazy Taxi, and and just and, and the modern modern Sonic franchises and things like that, and mm-hmm. the direction the company goes in. Yeah. Because it's certainly a company now, Sega, that's um, that's broadly doing things very differently to how they were doing it back then. And so, yeah, it'd be really interesting to to know what they thought of that. Yeah. So, the special edition. Um, yeah. That was for how how many of those? I'm looking here. There's about eighty that yeah, you have made. I think Did you have about seventeen left or something like that? Um, what are your yeah, plans I've got for the edition of hundred? Yeah. What are your plans for the extra ones? Uh, we're going to put them on sale on our site. We're going to be launching a, a full proper uh, web shop uh, when the book publishes. So um, the the last uh, numbers will be available from launch. Um, wow. So we'll be doing, if you sign up for our newsletter on readonymemory.vg, uh, you'll be you'll be told when the, the the time when we'll launch it is, so we, everyone can kind of come in and scoop them up. Very cool. Very cool. Um, any other updates uh, outside of the really cool interview you got with David Rosen? Maybe some. Uh, New games that were able to sneak in. Yeah, um, have you guys heard of um, a game called Spinny and Spike? You probably have. 
I think it was it was an STI game that was Sounds familiar. abandoned. Yeah, a, a few people have spoken about that in their interviews from the STI crew. Uh, and th- I think there was a lot of games that STI were working on uh, and abandoned. I think it was a really kind of creative time. Uh, and there's, there's quite a lot of talk about the creative atmosphere at STI. Uh, and a few people mentioned Spinny and Spike. Um, in terms of other things we've got uh, that we didn't have before, we've made contact with the designer of the uh, Sega VR headset. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was an external designer, and he's given us the pitch document that he uh, used uh, on the day that he went into Sega and showed them his design. So we've got um, some of the original drawings that he showed to Tom Kalinske uh, and some of the kind of rejected ones that look quite Geordie LaForge, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we've got them in there. Um, and we, we've got some news about the uh, production of the, the book. We're, we're making the book physically larger, the page size larger. Um, so it's going up... Uh, I think it was 190 by 240, and we are enlarging it. So it's going to be 216 by 267, so it's it's proper kind of coffee table book size now. Uh, And that was just um, one of the things that we were able to do because of all of the the kind of extra money we had, really. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm quite excited about how physically large it's going to be when it arrives. Nice. And uh, the Greg Martin art, I know that was a big piece of news recently, even though he, he actually passed away much I believe he passed away probably before you even got started on the book. Uh, That's right. Yeah, I think it was May last year. Yeah, it's it's yeah. unfortunate that we learned so late, but I mean, I'm, yeah, I guess better yeah. better than not at all. Uh, any updates on what you're showing? Yeah, well, the whole news came out when we were we were contacted by one of the collectors. Uh, there's, there's two guys who collect a lot of Sega original artwork, and and, and they were the ones who actually announced um, his passing. Uh, they, they were the ones who posted up on the forum about it um and they they got in touch with us to just offer their collection so we sent we were organizing a photographer to, to visit them and, and and shoot this stuff when that came out um and they as well as having lots of sonic art like the sonic 2 cover and there was an alternate sonic 2 cover with uh, sonic and tails standing in silhouettes against the two which i think was using promotional stuff and we've got that um and they, they've got a lot of greg's original sketches uh, pitch sketches as well that that were given to Sega to kind of direct the covers. So um, hopefully we'll be including all that. That's all with Sega at the moment for approval. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, so, and, and along with that, we've got um, uh, Greg Winters, who did the, uh, coming back to Streets of Rage, he did the uh, American and European Streets of Rage cover. So we've got the the original painting from that. Um, and also there's a lot of uh, Boris, Boris Vallejo uh, stuff. Um, so... I think there's Fantasy Star and uh, Echo the Dolphin as well. They'd had the, had those paintings, the original ones. So we've been able to include that. So that, that's just all people getting in touch with us without us kind of soliciting it. So That's easy. The, yeah, 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 the power of the Kickstarter has been, you know, we wouldn't have been able to make this book if we'd have done it in the traditional way because um, people were just getting in touch and offering stuff. Wow. Uh, were you able to track down the Sega Neptune? That was one of the uh, listener questions. It, yeah, it was it was really great timing to ask that because uh, at GDC, which is this week, um, the Video Game Museum, um, who are the company that still have the Neptune prototype, are there. And we've got a photographer um, going to meet them. Um, I think they're talking tomorrow about working things out. And yeah, so we're, we're going to shoot the Neptune in a way that's never been done before and retouch it so it looks fantastic, you know, like brand new uh, and have that in the book. Because, uh, I, I mean, the, the pictures of it at the moment are all quite grainy. Um, on, online, so you're going to be able to, to look at it really close up, and that's going to be in the hardware section. Um, and, and, and Sean, who runs the Video Game Museum, was telling me this week, and like my jaw dropped, and I just <laughs> I didn't understand what this was, but he said, we've got a controller menacer hybrid prototype, which was apparently uh, as like a handheld controller with the menacer light gun built into it, which I'd never heard of before. Uh, he didn't have a picture of it either, so I've, I've no idea what on earth it is, but I think it was an abandoned prototype that they've got. Um, so he was trying to find that in there. They've got a huge archive of um, unreleased consoles and, 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 and rare um, rare hardware. Um, so he's going to try and find that for us, and hopefully we'll be able to include that. Um, wow. but if not, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll shoot it anyway and, 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 and put it up somewhere so people can see it online. That's very cool. And yeah. I, hes- I hesitate to ask this question. Um, James Pond Olympics, is that going to be having... <laughs> no, you can ignore that. That's, <laughs> that's my friend Scott. Hi, Scott. Um, yeah, <laughs> I love that game, but you know, unfortunately, we're not putting any third-party stuff in, so it would, it would be a strange case to make for us to include, to include that one. 
Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's that's a, a bygone era of button bashing sports games, which I, I really miss. Um, Did you get that game in the, in the States? We, I don't know if we received that one. I'm looking here. It's pretty British. Yeah, I, I know we got the first three, I believe. I own the first one. I've seen the, the other two at the stores, but I don't know about the aquatic games. I don't know. This if that... is one of those ones where you kind of like rub the buttons or, or hammer the pad in order to run faster. Just like yeah. the real Olympics. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, break your own hardware. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if it would work on emulator because you essentially sort of break your keyboard quite quickly, I think. Well, he, James Pond, he had a game as recent as 2011. Is that right? Yeah, on iOS, James Pond and the Deadly Shallows. <laughs> Are you guys buying it right now on your phones? I hope yeah, so. That's why I went quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, as far as, I guess, moving into Genesis discussion, it's the 25th anniversary of the Sega Genesis, and uh, it's been um, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Genesis has been a little, not not a piece of contention amongst our writers, but a lot of confusion. It's been asked oh, you of mean me. Because of the staggered release dates. Well, yeah, it's been asked of me, well, why don't we focus on the Mega Drive as well? And I'm like, well, the Mega Drive last year was the 25th yeah, for the Japanese. Yeah, yeah, next October, year's. That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then next year's the 25th for the European release of the Mega Drive. But yeah. I don't know. There's something very distinct about the Genesis. I know it's the same hardware, a lot of the same games, but I really think you can't group the two together when, you, when it comes to talking about the experiences that uh, North Americans had the advertising, even the, yeah. down to the logo. It's, it's, it's a very unique thing in the video game industry. I mean, maybe the, the Famicom and the NES comes close. Yes. But, um, yeah, I mean, coming from someone who really did not experience the Genesis as we experienced it, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's really interesting that you, you mentioned that. I find that fascinating because I was trying to track back in my mind to my first experience with my Mega Drive. And uh, I was 10 years old, um, so it had just come out, I think. Uh, I think it was um, a, a, a Christmas pr- a present. Um, and my previous awareness of the Mega Drive was simply for grey import adverts in uh, European game magazines, such as Mean Machines, which was the, the main one that covered a lot of imported Japanese things. I remember reading lots of PC Engine reviews and seeing Japanese shoot 'em ups and finding it extremely... Um, you know, exotic. And then the Mega Drive kind of seemed to have that kind of charm as well. Um, But later on, uh, I became aware of the the Genesis. And as you say, the American advertising, the competitive advertising and the quite aggressive marketing campaigns. And it it really did seem like much more of a cultural event than the way I came to the Mega Drive. It was much more of a Japanese cool thing. And I think the way that it was presented to the American market was much more considered much more kind of of the time, much more aggressive. Mm-hmm. And, and therefore it must have had, a, you know, it, I feel like it must have been kind of burned into your minds when you first saw it on TV or whatever, whereas it was much more kind of gentle thing in, 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 in Europe. It was a little dirty too in Europe that I remember, wasn't it? There were some ads <laughs> over <laughs> there. You always... about the one, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the more you play with it, the harder it gets. Yeah, hey, that's yeah. the one. Oh. Like a hand around a, a joystick in a suggestive manner. But again, that's that's more in line with European advertising. They like to be a little risque, don't they? Yeah, I think that advert was in uh, Viz, which is a kind of crude uh, toilet humor uh, comic we used to have over here. Mm. Um, so it, it was made specifically for that market. But yeah, it was it, it was kind of inheriting the the tone of voice of you know the American advertising, which was kind of like an anything goes anarchic soundbite thing. Um, and yeah, we, we did inherit it. We 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 ended up with um, I don't know if you've seen the British adverts, um, which were done by a company called Dobley CRS, and we're, we're going to hopefully have them in the book. We just we just cleared the um, images from it. It was called Vid- uh, Jimmy the Video Game Addict. Okay. It was, it was this crazy um, kind of mess of pop pop cultural um, icons. There was a a cool kind of Han Solo guy. Uh, there was uh, a kind of neon. Um, metal uh, men's barbers where he was going in to have his hair cut, apparently. And there was a guy with him who was basically uh, the Asian kid out of Indiana Jones, and he had a dog with him. And then instead of having a haircut, he, he played Mega Drive games, and it was just all, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. It was so 1990s. Uh, and, and that was our kind of um, 
crazy ad- advertising campaign. But of course, you guys had um, what was the first one? Was that the um, w- Welcome to the Next Level? Was not the was no. after the Sega Scream stuff, wasn't it? I believe so. I I mean, I came in in 1991, which is I, I believe when the Welcome to the Next Level was going on. But in '89, it was the wasn't it the Genesis does what Nintendo don't? Isn't that of how course, it kicked off? Of course. Yeah, and, of course. Yeah, and I mean, it was it was. It's bizarre looking back at it, but I think it was something they needed to do because NES was really big at the time. The, Meg, the Master System hardly made a drop in the U.S. No, um, no, it's cool, right? Yeah. To be honest, I didn't even know about the Master System until around the Saturn era when I was seeing, I, I might have seen it at a yard sale or something. I was like, what the hell is this thing? But um, I, I think the name Genesis definitely gave the impression to me that this was the first Sega console, even though it completely wasn't. But, yeah, um, yeah. And and that aggressive marketing, too, really made it feel like this is a new company coming into the market to take on Nintendo. It was like, all right, it's the Genesis, it's the start of everything, and the Mega Drive. You're, you, you, it's At least that's how I read it as a kid. And so you, you said David Rosen actually named it the Genesis. Do you know why they picked that name? Well, actually, let me... Let me um... I'm just going to refer to my essay. Yeah, it, yes, um, he he thought that... So there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of circulating rumors prior to this about who, who and why it was called the Genesis in the U.S. And the, I think there were a lot of the common consensus about a copyright conflict. Um, but in speaking to, to David Rosen, he's claimed that he suggested the name and, and that he didn't like the name Mega Drive, and that you know, to be honest, it wasn't a. Um, it, it, it didn't sound like it suited the American market. It's quite a kind of. It's that kind of Japanese thing of, of nonsensical. Um, uh, English words being connected together, it's kind of like an emotional response thing. Uh, and I think he just saw it as a new beginning for the company. And I, I guess they were turning a corner. Um, and he just kind of felt that it was where the, the company needed to go. So that, that's that's what he's told us. I've heard different rumours about other suggested names as well. I know that there was a piece online suggesting that one of the suggested names would be the Tomahawk, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is, I can't imagine that at all. Um, but yeah. yeah, and we heard some other rumors as well that um, that Atari were approached about distributing the console in the US, and that it was them who suggested the name. But Rosen has, has, has said that none of that's true; that it came from him. So, hmm. it's Darren. Uh, what name do you prefer, the Mega Drive or the Genesis? Um, I think <laughs> I've got so used to saying Mega Drive Genesis because we're doing the book. <laughs> that it's just become one big. Uh, I, th- I think I prefer the Mega Drive just because it was. It, it doesn't make any sense, you know. It's just kind of. It, it is that kind of. Uh, it's like PC Engine. It's just some words that sound, you know, nice together. It's kind of like a. Uh, it, it's quite kind of haiku like, I suppose. I Does Mega Drive just sound odd to uh, to to you guys as a. It doesn't actually. I actually prefer the the name Mega Drive. I kind of wish they never changed it when they released it here. Yeah. Because like when I yeah. first heard the make, it was called the Mega Drive. When I was a kid, I was like, I don't believe it. Like that's too weird. <laughs> but it's now, weird, now it just makes sense to me. Like, yeah, it suits it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's it's. I I still always will love the Genesis name. Um, but I don't I don't know if I can choose either one. I feel like like Genesis was appropriate for the time and for the United States. Whereas Mega Drive does feel like a very Japanese name to me. Yeah, so I think Genesis kind of complemented the revolutionary marketing they were doing with it at the time. It just, you know, it, it was quite sort of shocking. And I think internally at Sega as well, the, you know, the, the, it's quite popularly kind of reported that, that the kind of the way that the American arm were publicizing and, and advertising the console would not sit well in Japan, you know, competitive advertising and attacking your rivals in, in, in commercials was just, you know, it was a cultural difference thing. It wasn't, it's not an accepted way to do business in Japan. So um, the fact that the console was called something else entirely must have kind of helped the case of convincing uh, the Japanese side that this was the right way to advertise a console. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, the closest that Sega Japan got to being kind of, not so much attack, but with the Sega to Sanshiro, it was... He was attacking he was attacking children? people, but he I don't know if he was attacking them for playing PlayStation. It was more the fact that they weren't playing Saturn. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. that's why I never understood with like Sega Japan. They're like, it's okay to 
for a karate guy to represent our brand and beat up children, but it's not okay to make fun of the competition. <laughs> or you take a look at the Dreamcast. They had um, uh, Yukawa, and he mm-hmm. would he would be depressed. It was more like the underdog. He was just he'd hear people talking about the the PlayStation, and he'd go home and cry to his wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then like things would start looking up. It was kind of like this. Uh, like this, I don't know, this sort of Charlie Chaplin kind of character or whatever who, who would, you know, he, he would just kind of fumble his way through his life and his job and be sad. And then everything turns around and the uh, people and like the, the Dreamcast. Yeah. Says, everything turns around and they discontinue the Dreamcast? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, Damn. but yeah, uh, I'm, the, uh, the, one of my favorite pieces of hardware is actually the Nomad. Now, what kind of uh, coverage does that get in your book? And also, did that ever get released in Japan? No, I don't think it I think it was just an American unit. Yeah, that's um, what I thought. Because we've got a mint condition nomads that we've photographed from the book. There's a collector who we, we've, we've got to know really well in, in, um, in, in London who runs Sega Nights uh, in London. It's a company called Vestron. And they have loads and loads of Mega Drives, projectors, um, Saturns, Dreamcasts, uh, the uh, the kind of headset for the Master System, um, and uh, the, the activator. And basically, they do club nights, so you can you drink and you play Sega, and then they have all this stuff there. Uh, and he had a mint condition Nomad, but it, yeah, it was a, it was a, a US only thing. We had a US connector for it. Which is kind of crazy because it was such a co- it's still such a cool piece of hardware. It is um, really a fantastic piece of hardware. The sound yeah. is is great on it. I'm not exactly sure which soundboard it has. Maybe the Genesis Two. Yeah, I guess so. Like, it, it's 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 also um, it's so compact. Like even when you hold up a an old Game Boy today, you're like, wow, this thing's huge. Um, but for what the Nomad does, it, it's remarkably compact. The screen is great, um, and it, it feels has really great in your hand. Yeah, it has video out too, which I always think yeah. is amazing. It it yeah. doubles as a console. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's a Wii U kind of uh, with more games. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's a lovely it's a lovely thing as well. I think uh, I bought along some cartridges and, and played the Revenge of Shinobi on it a little bit, and it was I fell in love with it. That and the Multi Mega um, unit are, are fantastic pieces of hardware. Now the Genesis also had the Genesis Three, which I believe is another piece of hardware that is exclusive to the U.S. I could be wrong. Oh, um, what? Yeah. Um, we had them um, we, recently. I, I remember in uh, the well, audio visual store here, they were selling uh, Mega Drive, I think they're called Mega Drive 3s, but I think they're made by a third party company. Um, but the Genesis 3 was first party, is that correct? It was uh, from Majesco, actually, oh, so but it was licensed out. I mean, yeah. Made in Mexico, I think. Really? Yeah, because we, uh, we were only allowed to include first party stuff, but I thought that was kind of good focus anyway. But I remember that the Mega Drive 3 didn't fall into what we were allowed to include, so that, that must be why the Majesco. Yeah, yeah Majesco also, uh, they made uh, Game Gears, which I, I believe their their Game Gear is better than the Sega Game Gear just because it's using newer components. I believe it's about five years later. Right. Uh, the Sega Pico also had a, a second version made by Majesco. The their Genesis 3 sucked, though. That did. It did. Yeah, I've never seen one in the flesh. It looks really flimsy and quite light. And the sound, the sound, the sound was terrible. I wanted to talk a little bit about the sound. Actually, it's it's one of the most inconsistent elements. I feel of the hardware. You you have people who I think experience a completely different kind of uh, uh, Genesis experience uh, with the Genesis three, as George was saying, awful sound. The Genesis two. Uh, George, you grew up with that, correct? Uh, no, my cousin had the Genesis. I well, I grew up with the Genesis. One and two, so okay. like I would. One of my cousins had one of them, and then I I acquired the Genesis one from my other. Like I had two cousins that had it, the Genesis, and so I I experienced them both. The first one, the Genesis one, to me sounded the best, and then the Genesis two sound, it was downgraded, but it wasn't as bad compared to like Genesis three. Mm-hmm. So did they change the sound chip? Yeah, yeah. They, right. Okay. And also the Genesis one, it had the uh, if the headphone input, which doubles as an output for stereo. Yes, yeah, I remember hooking it up to my hi-fi. And it's it's pretty funny because you can play the games, I think on the, when you have the Sega CD in, if you turn the volume knob up and down, the, the CD audio goes up and down, but the sound effects remain. I think that's what I remember. Oh boy, okay. So it's, I mean, 
I, I don't think that many people are that savvy at connecting it up. But if you connect a Genesis one correctly, it's it's fantastic sound. Yeah, because you've got so much control over it as well. Yeah, yeah, and I feel that the Genesis versus uh, SNES argument with the sound, I, I could never get into the, get into believing that the Genesis had inferior sound, even though. I guess it, it technically it does, but it can really do some amazing stuff, especially once we start talking about Streets of Rage. I wanted to talk a bit about the music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, we've got a lot of musicians in the book and talking about um, both the, the limitations of the hardware and also um, working directly with, with the chip, with the Yamaha chip, and about getting the best out of it. And I think it was such a kind of incubator atmosphere at Sega, I think they really, really pushed the hardware and really pushed the chip and basically made the best of the most distinctive noises of the, the, the YM chip. So I think mm. maybe that's why, you know, the in- inferiority thing is kind of a moot point because just what the Mega Drive did, it, it suited the kind of style of music which it became popular for, if you see what I mean, which is this kind of Yuzo Koshiro um, kind of... It, it was just perfect for that kind of nin- 90s dance music, the kind of synthetic drums and things like that. It was very good at producing a very heavy sound. I, I know I've yeah. listened to well, comparisons... Yeah soundtrack comparisons between the SNES and the Genesis. And I always feel like the SNES feels very soft. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess it sounds more realistic in a way if yeah. they were trying to mimic instruments. But the the, the, the YM, because um, we, um, with the Kickstarter video we did, we, we created a piece of music using the YM chip. We're using emulators. But the, the kind of sounds it could make, they're really kind of almost harsh and kind of buzzy. And, and that kind of gave it that real meaty, Mega drive feel. Yeah, it's, um, let me see, what else? I had another question. I just stumbled here. Should we move into Streets of Rage discussion? Yay, that sounds good. Well, I guess first off, I wanted to hear uh, your your thing. Uh, how how are How is Streets of Rage being covered within the book? Uh, to what extent? Uh, yeah, it kind of gets a lion's share of conversation. It, it, it makes you realize what, what, a, what an important game it was um, in terms of uh, Sega's, it, it, it was kind of Sega at the height of their powers, really, um, doing a game which, you know, there were a lot of scrolling um, brawlers at the time anyway, but they kind of, they they used their skills to inject a little bit of science and a bit of strategy into that kind of game and, and, and just come up with something really perfect. Um, and, of course, we've got the design document for the for the whole game, uh, which we're translating into, into English, um, we're, um, we're using a lettering artist, so we're we're really carefully matching the katakana and, and converting that into uh, block capitals and drawing out all the grids and little diagrams and things like that. So you can basically read how the game was planned and how it was talked about internally um, and get a sense for where it started out. And also there's lots of things in it that didn't make it into the game, but it kind of speaks of the ambition for, that they had for it. Uh, and also we've got lots of development art for it as well, um, lots of paintings, uh, and it, it's it's the game that's, that's talked about most in the interviews as well. It, it keeps coming up. Um, we've got Kashiro talking about it, and we've got uh, Noriyoshi Oba, who, who worked on it, who, who's talking about it as well and how it came together. So uh, it's my favorite um, Genesis game. So, it, yeah, it's it's. I'm glad to see it getting lots and lots of coverage. Yeah, it's... Um, I mean, I'll admit, I, I did not experience it when it first came out. It's It's just one of those things where when you're a kid, you have a limited access to you maybe grow up with 20 games and yeah. you love those games. And then, you know, you come back later and you realize there's about a hundred other awesome games that you can get involved with. Yeah. Um, you make your choices. So, yeah. And it's, I mean, thankfully I did have, I did grow up with Hyperstone heist, which is an awesome uh, Ninja Turtles beat em up from Konami. Uh huh. But um, yeah, I, I didn't really get into streets of rage until later. I think it was around the Saturn era that, um, I started revisiting things and especially with ROMs too, I could, I could play games on my computer. So I played those and, and it's, it's surprising that streets of rage is not based on an arcade game. Yeah. Like a yeah. lot yeah. of the other golden axe, um, Shinobi, Final you know, fight. like, Final I mean, fight. even like all those beat em ups were kind of like based on arcade games. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, comments in the design document that we we're translating about, I mean, there's a lot of tropes in it that don't need to be in it because if there's a timer for each level, and I don't know if you've ever got, like, it's never timed out. There's always a generous amount of time uh, on the in each stage. It's never a, it's never an option that you're going to run out of time. Uh, and in the design document, it says that. It says we're going to include a timer, but 
you know, it's always going to be a generous amount of time. You're never going to run out of time. So there was a sense of trying to bring the arcade into the home, like including these things which were largely um, not effectual to the game, but it was just evoking that arcade sort of feel in the home was such an important thing in that time because it was such an exciting thing to see the arcade on your 14-inch color television in your room or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to see that they were... The Final Fight gets mentioned a few time, times in, in the... Um, in the document and you can see that they're looking at it scientifically and saying, you know, how can they improve upon that and how can they make it work for the, for the home and make it more strategic. Um, so yeah, it's, it, I, I think it's, it's, it's one of those games where I, I, I don't know if I, I really prefer the first game to any of the subsequent ones. Cause I think the pace of play is much, is, is just, is just perfect, but it, it's really interesting to read about the way that they approached it and then go, yeah, it, it, it really is a very strategic game. Um, there's lots of talk in the design document about how um, you are, the way that you approach each enemy is really important in Streets of Rage. Uh, whereas in Final Fight, I feel like it's much more kind of um, it, it's much more kind of uh, like a brawler in the traditional sense. You just there's much less thought about how you would approach an enemy, but because people can grab you from behind and you can vault over people, there's there's much more thought going into each um, kind of attack. Yeah, I kind of, oh. Sorry, George. I was going to say, oh. I kind of got the the feeling of the Sonic versus Mario, uh, sort of Sonic was a reaction to Mario, just as Streets of Rage was a reaction to Final Fight. Yeah, yeah. And um, they def- Sega definitely had the advantage of being on the second, to, of obviously, to follow up from Final Fight, but also they, they weren't uh, adapting an arcade game, so they could go, they could push the hardware as much as they want, and no one would ever be comparing it to the non-existent arcade release of streets of rage yeah yeah it's an interesting uh it's an interesting story behind that and also i wanted to thank you too for sending us the design docs which should be live on the site uh probably the day before this goes out so people right. can go check them out yeah, um, it's in progress of what we're translating at the moment um yeah they, it's something they, uh, it's something i've never really really thought about is how they mark up design documents for games is this is this normally how they write them up uh, I have no idea. Yeah, this was the um, this is the first one that I've seen that's been in this much detail. We've done we've done other books, and um, you know things have been much scrappier. They're kind of like internal conversations rather than a very formalized document. Um, but you know, there's lots of um, tables and grids showing how uh, throws should work, um, the grabbing distances for different characters, uh, how much damage is incurred depending on how close an enemy is, and the the range of attacks and things like that. So it's really really scientific. Um, and then there's lots of talk more creatively about what, where they could push things. Um, one of the really interesting things I like is that, um, and it didn't make it into any of the games, but um, you know the, the vaulting move you can do if you grab a character, you can vault over their shoulders onto the opposite side in Streets of Rage, which is, you know, it leads to fantastic comedic situations where you get me make an enemy attack another enemy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they uh, wanted to make sure that you could do that with objects in the street, so like a, an oil drum or a wall, or there were going to be places where you could vault over things, but it was never implemented. And there were little drawings in the design document showing that, but I guess for various reasons they didn't include it. Well, the amount of control that they put in is pretty amazing. I Just to prepare for this show, I replayed the entire game last night, and I was, uh, I was actually playing the Sega CD compilation version, which is pretty much the same as the, the cartridge. And it's, it's, you know, you'd be probably at the fourth or fifth stage and you would do something that you had never done previously in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find that there's, there's these little nuances, especially with the reverse attacks yeah. um, and the um, landing on your feet mechanic, which if you're thrown and you hold up and see, then you land on your feet. It gives you so much agility uh, because you can basically let someone throw you into another group of enemies and then attack them. See, so I didn't even happening. know about that. Yeah, it's like, you know, there's all these kind of little kind of chess-like things you can do in it that, that give you, you know, the player a sense of power and satisfaction. Um, and it's, yeah, it's in, it's incredibly compelling still. Yeah, I played uh, Streets of Rage 2 this, like, Sunday, this last Sunday with, uh, with somebody from the forum online co-op. And, uh, man, that game is a lot, Streets of Rage 2 is a lot easier than I remember it as a kid. And uh, we tried, I tried 3 after that, and, man, Streets of Rage 3 is a, Pain in the ass, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I've tried to pass that as well. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know why it is like it is compared to. Two. It's like the yeah, cheapest it's... game I've ever played. Like they'll grab you in the middle of a like middle of a combo and just like throw you. <sighs> yeah. 
Yeah, let's talk about two a little bit. Um, mm. uh, much like Sonic Two, it, it feels like it's it just improves upon the original in about every sense. Uh, I believe the, the music's a lot better, which I want to get into as well. Mm. Um, I, I feel like the controls were pretty much the same. I'm not that uh, well versed in in the moves in Streets of Rage Two, but I know. Uh, like, uh, they introduced. They got rid of the um, kind of smart bomb mechanic where you could press A and have a police car turn up and annihilate everybody on the screen. Yeah, uh, and they replaced that with a energy sapping special move. I think you know uppercuts and fireballs and things like that. Um, so they were strategic in that you could use them, but you'd lose energy. Yeah, the um, the soundtrack by uh, and I, I hope I don't say his name wrong, Yuzo Koshiro. That's correct. He. Uh, I definitely think Streets of Rage 2 was him at his peak. I mean, yeah. he's done some music, beautiful music since then and before then, but uh, Streets of Rage 2, that is a fantastic soundtrack. And I think I even got into the soundtrack before I even played the game. Um, and I actually, I just wanted to uh, go straight was actually your your choice of one of your favorite tracks from the games. I'm just going to actually good. let that play now, and then we can come back and talk about it. Hey, great. sampling of the soundtrack uh darren did you want to talk a little bit about why you chose that one as your favorite yeah i think um we were talking about how the mega drive uh sounds give um you know kind of suit that kind of music uh and i, I think go straight is a really good example of of, of of all of the influences he was taking kind of things like cnc music factory and um kind of american hip-hop at the time and it, and because it's kind of filtered through the the, the ym chip you you get this a kind of beautiful kind of sludgy feel where everything kind of like merges together. You know, it's got this kind of wall, wall of sound kind of feel to it. Uh, and it's also got that kind of um, very popular at the time um, idea in 90s dance music where there would be a bit of the song that's like a payoff and it kind of builds and builds and builds and builds and then the, the song changes completely and the contrast between the two sections is is really thrilling. And of course, when you're playing, it's kind of subconsciously, you know, um, filtering into your mind and it just kind of, it really enhances what you're doing on the screen. Yeah, definitely. I, at, at the time, you know, too, a lot of songs, they would maybe be a minute, a minute and a half long, and then they'd loop. And so when, when you're first playing the game, first hearing the song for the first time, you're like, all right, this is pretty cool. It's a little eclectic. And mm -hmm. then you're a minute into playing the game. You're, I think at this point you're probably going down, you know, when the street starts turning and you're going downwards. And you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. We're, we're, we're walking down. You didn't do this in the first game. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, all of that kind of eclecticness comes together and kicks in with the main tune. And it's just such an awesome moment because you're, you're into the game now. You're starting to get used to the mechanics. There's some new surprises coming gameplay-wise. And all of a sudden, the music takes over. Yeah. And it's Absolutely. just it's probably one of the best like moments, I think, on the Genesis when playing a game. Sort of, I guess I'd compare it to when you play Res yeah. and the, in the final stage, and then the song kind of kicks in just as you fly into outer space. It's just one of those really cool moments that you can't really describe. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of s sort of pseudo-cinematic in that it, it, you know, it isn't synchronized with what you're doing on the screen, but, you know, you're kind of playing a part and you know it's coming and, you know, you just kind of go along with the whole thing. 
And George, you chose a track which we're going to start playing called "The Park." What's wrong uh, with it? Oh, we're in play right What's now. wrong with it? No, I'm no, not. I'm not. <laughs> well, they already picked "Go Straight," so I had to pick something else. Okay. Well, let's let's start oh, sorry, playing. Dude. No. <laughs> Tell us why you picked the park. Uh, a uh, park aside from Darren selecting go straight already. <laughs> on, on, I don't really have that great of a reason. I guess I just really like the track and I really like the level it was in. And I guess at the time when I used to play Streets of Rage, we they used to always. I used to live across the street from like a like I guess it's like a school, and they used to always have carnivals and stuff. And I used to always go, and that song was always stuck in my head and will never go away. So <laughs> I guess it's like part of me now. And I can't really describe why I like it. I just really, really like it. It's a really good song. That's cool. Like a nostalgic kind of. Uh, yeah, it's like a nostalgic. I guess people have like movie themes they're into. I'm, I guess, into video game music that uh, gives me nostalgic. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, my pick, I, I decided to pick the um, the intro music to the, the very first game. Not even the level music, but just when oh, you yeah. boot the game up. So we're going we're gonna to let that play right now. the track and uh, the reason i picked that was it's it's not a song that i would ever want to listen to you know on an mp3 player really but it's just it's one of it's a very moody atmospheric it almost reminds me of the beginning of an 80s action movie yeah exactly it has that kind of um prelude to excitement thing going on and it's yeah it's it's a great build-up so i mean it's i don't have much more reason than that but i just think it's it's such a great moody introduction to the and it makes you really want to read the whole thing too because typically i skip past the uh, scrolling text i just want to get into playing the game yes but, that's you have the uh, the plot of the game scrolling sort of star wars like across the screen isn't it yeah yeah i have to wonder if they were actually uh, influenced by that i actually have um here from the design document the original um the original plot which is quite different from what was um oh. uh shall I, shall I read it it's quite short absolutely um, um, if, you, if you can imagine the music in the background. Uh, the, the, Maybe I'll the start playing it. Yeah. The 21st century has become the age of the criminal. Cities such as Tokyo, New York, L.A., Hong Kong and London are rampant with organized crime. Uh, it says the ICPO, part of the International Judicial Administration, has been held responsible and as a result has been denied the right to arrest. 
finding themselves in dire straits, the ICPO has assembled a special task force. Their purpose? To wipe out criminals. To avoid public condemnation, they operate in secret, without firearms. This unique group of warriors have transformed their bodies into deadly weapons. Now, they strike dread and vengeance into the heart of the criminal world, who refer to them as Dragon Swats. Uh, <laughs> Dragon Swat being the, the working title for the game, which I, I suppose the Double Dragon um, uh, sort of uh, influence is quite clear there. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Dragon Swat. Yeah. yeah I, don't I guess know. Swat as well was, was a quite popular Sega game at the time. So. Was it seen as a, a direct sequel to any game early on in development or... Was no, that- it was definitely um, in one of the interviews. Uh, Obasan talks about speaking to, strangely enough, Yuzo Koshiro about doing a game called Street Karate, is what they referred to it as. <laughs> I like um, that name better. <laughs> Street yeah, Karate. yeah, I'd play that game, right? <laughs> um, it, so yeah, it was it was uh, it was a completely original idea. I mean, I think Final Fight and Double Dragon were you know kind of things that you know it was clear that Sega hadn't done that and that that was you know a, a big genre to try. Um, but yeah, it started off as an original thing entirely. So coming the the name uh, Bare Knuckle is actually the Japanese name. I don't know if we've really spoken about that much yet. But um, what what was the reason for changing over, or was it just some regional thing that they thought wouldn't sell here? Yeah, no one's no, no one's spoken about that actually. I assume it, I assume it's a little bit. Um, I, but at the time, I think there was a lot of sensitivity about violence in video games, um, and I wonder if that was seen as as an overly violent name, whereas Streets of Rage was much more kind of um, cinematic, I suppose. But uh, no, we, we we don't have an answer to that, I'm afraid. I, I'm, I'm guessing it might have been um, a an, sort of a, a taste matter. You know, if it, if it seemed a bit violent, perhaps they shied away from it. Maybe the name Bear implies nudity. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like Knuckles, Sonic and Knuckles, you have bare knuckles, and he's, yeah. like, showing it all. No, but uh, I, I'd say it's a rare instance where I prefer the re- the Streets of Rage over Bare Knuckle. I think it's a better name. Yeah, me too. Yeah, Bare Knuckle, I mean, it just makes me think Bare Knuckle Fighting. It's, it's, it, it is very violent, and it yeah. is, it's much more a, a stylish game than that. It is much more kind of um, an 80s hard-boiled action flick than it is a fighting game. And we also had, I wanted to talk about the, the artwork, too. I know you're featuring it in your book, and I also am sitting here with the another book, Video Game Illustrations. Um, I'm sure you have a copy of this. It's a fantastic book. And my favorite favorite thing about it is, despite being a Japanese book, it has uh, everything translated inside. So um, just looking at the original Japanese artwork here, uh, the artist, whose name is, I hope I don't butcher it, Yo- Yoshiki... Yoneshima? Okay, yeah, yeah I think we, we've got um, the scans from that book, so the, those will be featuring in it as well. Um, yeah, that's the, uh, the... I like that Japanese box art a lot. That, is that the one with Axel stood forefront uh, and it's quite kind of uh, yes. red and flamey? Yeah, uh, Yeah, it's red and flamey at the bottom. Uh, the Streets of Rage 2 is all red. It's got the crazy laughing guy. Um, yes, and the and, Jean-Claude Van Damme Axel. And, and they actually even say that there, even though they, they misspell Jean-Claude Van Damme, they say Van Damme. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> yeah, for, for the Streets of Rage 2 Mega Drive cover, he said, I took more care to draw these characters realistically than I had before. I made the hero Axel in the middle of the cover by imaging, imagine, it's kind of messed up writing, I- imaging Jean-Claude Van Damme, who is an action star. Based <laughs> on the images in the game's software, I drew other characters as well. On the whole, I wanted the hero and his friends to quietly show their fighting spirits in the background flame. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great artwork. Also, um, uh, Max looks like, well, uh, looks exactly like Arnold Schwarzenegger in that. Yeah. Uh, Blaze looks like Brooke Shields. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is, who is Skate modeled after, or is it just random little boy? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I couldn't work that one out. There must, there must be an equivalent one. It's funny. He almost skate almost looks a little Asian. I don't know. Yeah, he's very slight in it. Yeah, <laughs> and in the game. The book, I believe, this uh, illustration book came out before Bare Knuckle Three because it does not include it. Um, That's right. Yeah, I think that was ninety four. That book. And I wanted to talk about Bare Knuckle Three too. It's kind of the the odd one out. People don't really talk about it that much. And as George mentioned, uh, 
at least in his opinion, it, it doesn't stack up to the other games. I, I, well, hey, don't put words in my mouth. Come George on. said he hated it. From <laughs> no, I hated it. No, uh, I just thought it was cheap as hell. That's all compared to like the other ones. It's like they they ramped up the difficulty on the third one for sure. Yeah, and the the music too. I I actually gave the whole soundtrack a listen. It's very. I don't know. I find it kind of hard to listen to. I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. It's it's very yeah, it's, experimental. It is. It's very experimental. It, it's um. It, it takes the parts of Streets of Rage, two, which are kind of very dancey, very very kind of New York pubby stuff, and it, it kind of it runs with those, and you kind of lose the you kind of lose the hooks and grooves from the earlier games, and it just becomes quite um yeah experimental, and 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 in that way, it's very hard to get that kind of feeling of exhilaration and being carried along by the music in it, I find. Um, also, it's the first one to... to uh, there's lots of people with guns in, in Streets of Rage 3. I yeah. think there's the kind of... Yeah. Um, the men in black with guns. And and, and having guns in a, a, a scrolling beat-em-up, um, it, it's very difficult to balance that correctly, and I always find that quite frustrating, being shot from across the other side of the screen. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just the balance isn't quite right with that game. It doesn't... It doesn't. It, it constantly feels frustrating in a way that the previous two don't. Do you know any reason behind that uh, development-wise? Was it the same team, or were we dealing with uh, something different in that sense? Yeah, I can. While we're talking, I can try and pull up the interview with um, the person we have on it. I think there was. I think there was a change in the team, and I think um, I've got a feeling based on the dates that we were we were looking at when we were researching it. We're not covering this in the book, but I've got a feeling personally that it was um, done quite quickly. Um, and there's, I think if there's, um, there's a, an online site which looks up at video game lost levels, uh, mm. and I think there's, I, I was reading a lot of brilliant stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll send you it afterwards so we've got a link. Um, uh, there's lots of parts of the levels in Streets of Rage 3 which have basically got a fake wall put in and the, the level's been ended early. So, and a lot of the code suggest, has, contains levels that were deleted. I think there was um, one where you were speeding along a, um, a bridge and people are like throwing oil cans off the back. And there's kind of lots of high concept levels that just were abandoned but left in the ROM. Um, so I, I, there's kind of a common consensus that basically the, the production was kind of rushed, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps for a Christmas period or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it, it wasn't given the length of development. It, 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 it deserved. Now, do you feel it was a reaction at all to any specific games coming out at the time? I don't know. It was quite late era Mega Drive um, yeah. game, wasn't it? Because that was one that passed me by. I remember buying um, the first two and being really excited about them. But I remember by the time that Streets of Rage 3 came out, I was aware of it. I remember it being really expensive in the UK as well. I think it was, it was around the time of the uh, virtual racing and you know when certain carts were more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, I do remember that one for some reason being about ten pounds more expensive than than other games, and for a lot of reasons it wasn't it wasn't in a lot of shops. I remember it being quite a difficult thing to get hold of, um, and I think people were making the move at that time to other consoles. So it really, um, just got lost in the shuffle. Of, I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah it's unfortunate. If you were to look at what other games came out at the same time, because it, it might be, it might explain the reason why that got buried a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think about the fact that you could play as a kangaroo and there's like an old dude with robot hands? There is an old dude with robot hands, which by all accounts should be good, but... <laughs> are we like, talking about Tekken or are we no, talking no, no. about there, Streets of Rage 3? Streets of Rage 3 has an... You could play as a kangaroo, you unlock them once you yeah. beat the first level. And it's kind yeah, of strange because like this gimp guy comes out with a kangaroo with like a dog collar on. And then after you beat it, you can unlock the, the kangaroo. But it almost sounds like they're moving into Tekken territory at yeah. that point. Yeah. 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 And they also had the worst art cover, too. I mean, cover art compared to the last two. Let me check that out. I haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah, I think it looks quite comic booky, doesn't it? it do oh, my God. Look at the kangaroo well, the in the back. I feel sorry for, for the, the British version. What is this? It's like a... <laughs> A guy in a blue spandex suit with a Fu Manchu and then a woman with her yeah. neck broken. It's kind of, yeah, and it's quite sort of, I don't know, it looks quite kind of, it looks like it's kind of aimed at quite young kids as well, which kind of feels a little weird. 
It's kind of the equivalent of what episode three, episode four, Star Wars is to the Clone Wars. It yeah. kind of feels like it's like kind of super deformed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the American cover, my goodness, that's bad. Oh man. Well, what does the <laughs> Japanese version look like? Not to get all Google image searching during a show, but I want to see. Think I've seen that. Uh oh, I've never I've never seen that before. No, neither have I. I'm looking at that with it yeah, looks, what, speaking of Star Wars, it reminds me of the Attack of the Clones poster a little it bit. It does. It's, got, it's backlit. It's kind of sunset-y. There's lots of lens flare. Abrams yeah. would like it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've never seen that before in my life. It's probably yeah, the best I, of them. This really was a buried game. It, it, it really sort of, uh, I guess it didn't have the clout behind it in terms of the way that, that Sega was pushing it as the other ones. Um, yeah. And there were, there was, I mean, just speaking it as, as the series as a whole, there were a lot of really goofy things going on. I know we, we did have uh, gay enemies. I mean, let's yes. not walk around that. They they definitely were going for a leather man kind of uh, vibe there. What what was up with that? So, yeah, that character, w- was he removed or was he downplayed uh, in the American version? Is that right? He might have. Uh, was he in the first game? No, he wasn't. I think the, the character who, who's kind of, he's got sort of leather leggings on. And I think he might have kind of, not heels or pointed shoes. Uh, and he's kind of like a grotesque uh, stereotype of uh, of a kind of biker homosexual. I mean, it's really uncomfortable to look at. Yeah. Um, and I think he I think he might have been originally planned to be a selectable character in the Japanese version. But I think he might just be an incidental enemy in, in the US version. But you might have to correct me on that. I'm looking here. Bare Knuckle 3, uh, Japanese version, also features, and this is written in uh, a forum... Uh, a lovably offensive, offensive gay stereotype, Ash, <laughs> who becomes a playable character after you defeat him. Oh, right, yeah, that's it. Yes, I knew that you could control him. Yeah, I think lovably offensive is exactly the right way to put it because it's just so over the top and grotesque. There's no possible way that you can take it seriously. He's got his own legs it's, turned it's inward, kind of limp-wristed, has the male sign across his chest. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Jessica Rabbit's legs for some reason. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Huh. Well, maybe there was, that was one of the reasons the game didn't get much uh, play in America. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps. I just didn't I, like I'm it. I'm looking at the picture. I don't see anything gay about this. This looks pretty freaking normal to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George, we'll talk later. <laughs> oh. yeah, I was going to say, we're on a video call, and yeah, that looks a bit weird what you're wearing. <laughs> wow. Well, um, the other things we have um, from the book is a, a, a timeline. Uh, from the, the design of the first game, showing actually how they scheduled the production of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's quite interesting to see how that they designed each stage. So they started with the very last stage, stage uh, A, which is the Mr. X machine gun, um, it's basically Scarface um, corridor section, uh, and then spent, um, I think it, it looked like a, the, the the most time they spent was on the first stage. So I guess the first stage in um, Streets of Rage is, is extremely colourful, and quite graphically complex, lots of parallax scrolling and things coming in front of the screen and things like that. So it, it looked like they spent so much time on this first stage, they really wanted it to be kind of like a showcase because um, I remember the first time I saw it, it was running in a shop on a tracked mode, which was quite a common thing at the time. And I think, you know, the, that kind of visceral look of the first stage is really important to them. Um, and uh, we, it looks like the whole game, uh, we tweeted this recently from the ROM account, um, in terms of the schedule, there's only two months here. So it, it may have run later, we don't know. But the, the plan uh, and the way that it was scheduled, Streets of Rage 1, it looks like it was just made in two months, which is really impressive. That's that's crazy when you yeah. consider indie games made for the system can yeah, sometimes exactly. take up yeah. to three years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, look at things like Fez, you know, and it's, it's yeah, it, it's it was, I guess it's that kind of, it, there is a sense that there was some kind of magic at, the, at that time in Sega. A lot of the people who came to the project were really, you know, recently experienced in other great Sega games. Um, you know, like the Shinobi games, Nori Yoshioba had already worked on Revenge of Shinobi. Um, and they just came to it really wanting to do it, really wanting to create this street karate game. And, you know, it, it was almost kind of like flicked off the wrist. It was really, you know, it, it, it seems like a, a, a casual game in terms of the way it was scheduled. And it, it still means a lot to so many people. Would you say that it definitely would? It, would you say it eclipsed Final Fight? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I I remember 
Final Fight CD actually is is a fantastic game. I think it's one of the kind of like best examples of what the Mega CD could do in terms of what the cartridge games couldn't. Uh, and the the characters in it were considerably bigger on screen, but I always find myself getting bored more, much more quickly in Final Fight because there aren't those things we were talking about, the strategic possibilities. And you put it really well yourself where, you know, there's things like in the game where you're kind of like, wow, I didn't realise I could do this. Like you're, you're on the lot, on the, the level seven, which is the elevator stage uh, going up into the boss's hideout. Um, you can throw enemies off the edge of the elevator and you're not previously ever able to do that. And it's really satisfying to do. And I feel like there's much less variation in terms of what you can do in Final Fight. But it, it is graphically superior because the, the sprites are bigger. But yeah. say so compensate it with the strategy. They, they always seem to compensate somehow on the, on the Genesis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so looking forward to the future of the franchise, I mean, we really haven't seen anything new after Streets of Rage 3. Um, are you aware of any internal discussions to revive the franchise in the past or in, in anything I like saw, that? Um, I, I think it was maybe two years ago or one year ago. There was um, a leaked video of, I think it was a, uh, an external um, developer who, I guess you guys have seen this, right? The 3D Streets of Rage prototype. Um, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah which it, it was obviously really early and it, you know, it looked like level one from Streets of Rage, and, um, but in 3D. Um, but it, it looked like it was really, really early. Um, but I guess that got canned for whatever reason. Um, I think it was, it was, a, I think it was I mean, Golden I, X, wasn't it? No, no, no. You're thinking, yeah, I'm looking at here, uh, Ruffian Games Streets of Rage prototype. Uh, then there was two of them. There was one recently about uh, doing the Sega Legacy series in 3D, but oh, they wow. showed Golden X. Oh, but that's, that's a different oh, thing. Yeah. This one, it's um, I, I can't tell if it's in game or CG, but it starts off in an arcade where you actually see Streets of Rage oh, outrun. Yeah, I remember. And it's that. funny, <laughs> there is no such thing as the a bare knuckle two arcade cabinet, but there it is. So yeah. <laughs> maybe Sega took offense to that. They're like, "Uh, guys, it's not an arcade game." Yeah, guys, <laughs> actually, it's a I found, game, but that's I, not canon. So. I found that kind of funny because if you play Streets of Rage two, there's an arcade level two and it has bare knuckles. <laughs> the arcade, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, <laughs> the pirate chip one, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it looks like you come out and it's fully 3D. Um, but I guess it was a pitch video. Yeah, they, I guess so. So it was never something that uh, Sega themselves were, like, making internally. But um, I think there was, there was an internal Streets of Rage 3D, which I think there were YouTube videos you can watch of. And I assume that would have been Saturn. Um, and it's really, it's that kind of Virtua type 3D, the kind of really blocky polygons. Okay. And it's really, really, really early, and it's just Axel, uh, a very uh, polygony Axel walking around a street. I think it's just a, a test demo that somebody leaked. Um, so clearly they, they they started to do it, but um, uh, it, it didn't make it that far. Uh, Darren, did you ever hear the the rumor? I don't know if it was a rumor or more of a fact that uh, Sega tried to uh, buy uh, Fighting Force. I think that was a PlayStation One game, the three D fighter. Oh really? And they they were trying to label it uh, Streets of Rage Four or whatever. They're trying to buy the game that was in development. Right. That, so I've heard that episode. before. I don't know if it's true. I've always wondered if that was true. Yeah, yeah. Um, because what was the big uh, fighting game on the um, on uh, Saturn? Dynamite Decca. Di- yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, that was it. Yeah. Um, I, I guess that kind of took over as and and of course Virtual Fighter as well. So perhaps they felt that things were moving more towards the the two-player fighting genre, because, of course, Streets of, uh, Street Fighter was so popular. So maybe, I mean, the, the scrolling beat up actually is a kind of a bit of a lost art, so perhaps they abandon it because of that mm. that trend towards, you know, moving away from that. Um, but things like Castle Crashers recently, uh, and, you know, I don't know if you played the um, Arkham City uh, scrolling level with Robin, where it was basically kind of an, uh, an homage to Final Fight and Streets of Rage, where... It's a side-scrolling version of the Batman fighting <laughs> engine, um, which worked fantastically. I think we could see it coming back. And there's Double Dragon Neon as well recently, which is great. That's true, yeah. And, I mean, we've even seen uh, just yesterday from Sega, they revealed that they're um, making a mobile uh, sequel to Crazy Taxi. So oh, yeah, yeah, I saw the pictures. Um, but it's it's more of a spin-off. Um, but still, it's, it's an internal Sega studio... Um, a Western studio developing a new game in a Japanese franchise. So who knows? Maybe we could see, uh, you know, one of their internal developers 
taking Streets of Rage and making a new one. Uh, so that would be great. We're that would be. That would be. Oh, we mm-hmm. were talking about uh, Streets of Rage, I guess, uh, cameos or uh, recent uh, uh, mentions. Uh, yes. Did, did you, have you played uh, Saints Row 4? There's a, there's a part in the game where you uh, it actually goes into like a retro arcade, and, it, and they have a big homage to – I posted the picture. It's called Saints of Rage, and it's like a little 2D <laughs> beat-em-up thing. It's pretty good, but uh, I was just going to mention that. Oh, I'm watching it right now. Yeah, it's definitely... Uh, that's cool. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. There's a lot of love for it. Yeah, it's definitely not dead, uh, despite their... Well, we did have uh, 3D Streets of Rage not too long ago on 3DS. So, oh, yeah. of course. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Sega's definitely not ignoring the franchise, but, you know, it's just... It's one of those things where how do you make it again? Do you go fully 3D, and is that even Streets of Rage at that point? Yeah, good point. Um, or do you do one of those uh, sort of uh, callback ones where it's definitely trying to be retro? Yeah, so. I think a middle ground would be quite nice to take the mechanics of, thing, of things like you know Arkham City and the kind of the modern fighting mechanics and, and Yakuza as well, mm-hmm. which I, I suppose is quite complex fighting mechanics, really really fun, and you know it happens in a street; it's it's not that far away from it, and then try and apply that to a a horizontal plane fighter, I think that would be really cool. Yes, yeah, so there's there's definitely possibilities for the future. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but uh, yeah, Darren, were, th- were there any more things you wanted to share about your book? We're nearing the end of the show, so I just wanted to make sure we get squeeze you for all the information we can. Yeah, um, I just yeah, I wanted to kind of like feedback and say everything's uh, kind of going really well, going to plan. Um, and it's just huge. It's it's 352 pages now. It's bigger than than we'd originally pitched. Um, we're going to be able to spend more money on the finishes. I think I, I really hope and I really think that everyone's going to be delighted when it when it turns up. And it's 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 going to kind of take a few evenings to digest. Mm. Um, and I think we we counted the word count, including all of the interviews with developers, and it's something like 75,000 words wow. uh, along, with, you know, hundreds of pages of images. So um, yeah, I, I'm really pleased with how it's going. So. And if you want to follow progress, then follow us on Twitter, uh, which is ROM Alerts. Um, and, and we kind of like post little quotes and little updates about what we're doing day to day on it as well. Yeah, I love those quotes. I always retweet them and I wonder if people know the context. <laughs> 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 They'd be like, I, we went with black. And then someone would be like, what are you talking about? But no. Yeah, they're... there was one about um, Sega in, in America not knowing what a hedgehog was when it was first pitched as well, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's an echidna? That's the real question. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Well, and do you have a uh, expected release date? So everything's on schedule, yeah. Our release date on Kickstarter was June, and that's still very much what we're aiming for. The printers are all ready, and that's the schedule we've got set in place. Everything is with Sega at the moment, so we're, we're kind of waiting to hear back on, on, on what gets approved and what doesn't, and then sort of apply that to our design. So if everything goes well, then that's exactly when we'll be publishing. Very cool, and I know you also planned on a companion website. Is that still in the cards? That's right. Yeah, so we've got um, we're working on a new website at the moment, which um, is going to sort of include excerpts of the book as well. So um, when that launches, you'll be able to read little bits of it, things that we didn't include, um, lots of kind of complimentary content, uh, and so you'll be able to buy the poster as well, which was one of the uh, other Kickstarter tiers that we offered. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, so um, that'll be launching this summer as well, along with the book. Oh, wow, well, we'll definitely be promoting that. I know we, uh, okay. over the past year, we uh, took on the Sega Retro Wiki, so we're we're moving into okay. that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's actually that falls under us. So, oh right. Um, so we we are definitely moving forward into more of that. Uh, I mean, we'll still have our opinion based stuff, but I also really love just sharing pure historical information, data, art, and things yeah. like that. Absolutely. So um, I'm really looking forward to that companion site. Is there going to be any video? I know there's uh, a lot of commercials out there that are very hard to come across in good quality. Yeah, we've, we we've got we've got all of them in full res from the the uh, we've got all of the the Welcome to the Next Level stuff. We've got all of the um, Sega Shout stuff, and we've got all of the UK stuff. That's a really good idea. Maybe I'll look into clearing it all so we could archive it because be amazing. I, don't think, I don't think there's a definitive collection of it on on youtube because there are heaps of american ads and it'd be really cool to host it in one place yeah that That's would that idea. would be an amazing i mean it'd be amazing thing to do because it's something that 
yeah, it, everything's on VCRs. They're all really scrambled. They have yeah. uh, watermarks, but to get beautiful, clear uh, clips of these on on your website would be would be awesome. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if that's possible. Cool, cool. Well, um, George, is there anything you wanted to add or ask? Oh, I was going to ask, uh, what food in Streets of Rage, you know, the health food, which one do you think mm-hmm. looks the most delicious? Uh, well, mm, I, I, I like the apple because it comes on a little plate, which <laughs> just seems extravagant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never understood. Cool. Is it an apple? What is it? Somebody tells me it's a pie sometimes when I play with people. They're like, that's a pie, obviously. Oh, man. Yeah, I've never said that out loud before, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I thought it was a massive apple on a, on a tiny plate. Everybody We've thinks had... it's something different. I think it's an apple, too, honestly. Because <laughs> if I think I, if I, if I had the chicken and I was fighting in the street, I think I'd have to sit on a step for a little bit and take a little break. But I could work with an apple. I definitely think it's – if it is an apple, it's definitely one of the, the best apples in video gaming. Uh Next to uh, Mickey's projectile apples and Aladdin's projectile apples. Oh yeah, Mickey's apples. Yeah, they're they're very well rendered. I think a whole piece on apples is is needed. I instantly thought that's a great are, idea. You what might... do you call it? Apples and oranges, or what do you? No, call I think <laughs> I think Darren should actually give Sega a call and be like, "Look, we're we're adding an apple article. We're gonna have to <laughs> delay the whole thing." Apple, no, no apples in your games. Okay. Yeah, well, they're they can hurt you, but they can also heal you. It makes you wonder if the enemy catches the apple in his mouth, is he healed? Exactly. Is there a biblical subtext? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, Darren, I wanted to thank you again for joining us. Uh, it's been Thanks a great, great discussion, lots of cool information, and this book is just sounding better and better every time we talk to you. Great. I'm really pleased you heard that. So um, uh, we'd love to have you on again uh, before the book launches, so we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch. Maybe we can get some more uh, exclusive pieces of art out there to – let yeah, great. See. Yeah, maybe as soon as it's signed off and gone to the printers, then then I can start sharing some of the essay stuff with you. And yeah, we can talk about that. That'd be so cool. Yeah, so um, we'll have you on sooner than last time for sure. Great. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Cheers, Barry. Say goodbyes. Bye. Bye.